All right, welcome everyone. We're thrilled to have you here tonight for the Family Academy Literacy Reimagined Changes in the K-5 Literacy. This evening, we'll take an in-depth look at the new K-5 Literacy Program. You'll discover practical strategies and valuable resources to support your child's literacy journey at home, empowering them to achieve academic success. Once again, thank you for joining us on this important journey. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ronnie Shoa, and I am the Supervisor of Communications and Engagement with WJCC Schools. I'm also excited to introduce to you two key individuals joining us tonight and presenting Mrs. Robin Ford, the Director of Elementary Curriculum and Instruction for WJCC Schools, and Dr. Robin Moore, Elementary Literacy Coordinator and Division Dyslexia Advisor. Before we dive into the to tonight's um, Family Academy, I do want to do a quick plug. Um, I want to highlight an exciting in-person Family Academy that's happening next week. Join us on Wednesday, October 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. at Jamestown High School for a Family Academy named Family Focus, Building Healthy Tech Habits Together. Our students have made tremendous progress in keeping their personal devices off and away during the school day. And, next, and at next week's event, we'll explore ways to build on that success by creating healthy technology habits for every member of the family at home. The event will feature breakout sessions on topics like creating a balanced living plan for your family, mental wellness supports, positive parenting in the digital age, the dangers of social media, internet safety, and supporting students with disabilities. There'll also be a resource fair with local organizations and healthcare providers as well. We highly recommend registering in advance by signing up. You'll be entered in for a chance to win a free copy of the New York Times bestseller, The Anxious Generation, and other raffle prizes. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put in the link in the chat if you wanna register. Um, food will be provided and limited childcare will also be available if, um, as long as you register. Um, and you may register tonight again, as I mentioned, uh, by either scanning the QR code or clicking the link in the chat. Once again, thank you for joining us tonight for this Family Academy on Literacy, and we're excited to get started. All right. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Um, we are so glad to be here with you this evening. I'm Robin Ford. Um, I've been with the division for 30 years in positions from classroom teacher to reading specialist to administrator, and now um, a very proud member of our um, division's curriculum and instruction team. And I'm Robin Moore, and I've been a member of the WJCC school staff and family for about 20 years, and I've had the joy of being a kindergarten teacher, student support teacher, reading coach, and I'm also serving our school division from central office as well. So we are looking forward to the information that we need to share with you this afternoon. And we hope that as the presentation goes along and you think of questions that you will drop them in the Q&A. Um, we will wait until the end of the presentation to answer your questions, but we look forward to and have allowed plenty of time to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can this evening. So for this evening's presentation, we have three goals. Um, we are going to review the impact of the Virginia Literacy Act legislation to public education in Virginia. We will look at high quality resources for parents and guardians, and we will share strategies, key strategies that you can use to support your children's literacy development at home. So we're gonna take a quick look at the Virginia Literacy Act and some of the uh, rationale behind it. There are decades of research that document for us how we can teach students to become effective readers. You may know or may not be familiar that the human brain at birth does not have any neurons or connectors that are wired for interpreting the visual symbols or letters that we use to represent speech in written form. So students must be explicitly taught how to match the sounds that they hear to the letters and letter patterns that we use to represent those sounds. And this is the basis for the Virginia Literacy Act that we're using evidence-based literacy instruction 
and evidence-based literacy instructional practices that are aligned to science-based reading research. And we know that providing lots of opportunities for students to engage with high-quality books is essential for developing the will to read. We also know that there's a documented uh, that there is a documented sequence of skills that students must learn in order to develop that skill for reading. Reading comprehension is not a single entity. It's a group of skills. And so each of those skills can be explicitly taught and practiced. And when we put them all together, that's how we can make meaning of the visual symbols that are written on the page. So we'll take a look at our next slide here. This is, a, um, this is a visual, it's called the simple view of reading. And the entire reading process can be described by this simple equation. The blue box contains all of the skills that are required for interpreting the print on a page of text. These skills include recognizing the sounds in language, all the way down to the smallest unit of speech sound. Those are the individual sounds that make up a word. So for example, the word cat has three individual sounds. The word, the sounds would be the k, at. And so those three sounds, when we blend them together, then make up that full word of cat. The blue box contains all of the skills that are required for matching the letters that we see printed to the sounds that we hear when we speak. After the, uh, after the uh, multiplication sign, we have the red box, which contains all of the skills that we need in order to make meaning from what's printed on the page. So the blue box is for what we need in order to process the words that are printed on the page. The red box are all of those skills that help us interpret and make meaning. This includes understanding the meaning of each of the words that we read. We call this vocabulary. If we were to read a text about baseball, the words strike and ball and base and bat those would all have a completely different meaning from the story about factory workers going on strike or a princess going to a dance or going to the ball. So that vocabulary and that understanding about the meaning of the words, but also the background knowledge to know the context that those words are being used in are really important for that language comprehension. The language comprehension box, it does also represent that need for background knowledge. If we read a text, that same text about baseball, and didn't have any knowledge about the game, we may not understand that the players running the bases actually means that they're going around the field in a square or a diamond shape with one base at each corner. So when we put all of these skills together for reading, the print on the page and making meaning from it, when we put that all together, we have our final product, and that's the full understanding or skilled reading comprehension. So this is a lot. It's a lot that we as teachers and as educators um, have in our toolbox and understanding and learning that teachers go through in order to then be able to translate that into explicit and appropriate instruction for students. All of the learning is challenging the neurons in your little one's brain. The learning, they say learning to read is like rocket science and our teachers really are the expert engineers. I know when my children come home from school and they just need some time to run around and clear their heads, it's because their brains have been working hard all day, repurposing those neurons and brain signals and building all of those connections. So the Virginia Literacy Act is legislation that establishes systems and supports that are designed to make a meaningful in impact on the literacy education for our children. So all of that science about how students learn to read 
has been distilled into legislation to help us as educators and families and communities serve our children and uh, become and help them to become literate members of our community. The intention of the Virginia Literacy Act is to help school divisions to make sure that the science-based reading research and evidence-based literacy practices that are necessary for skilled reading are present in every single classroom. The Virginia Literacy Act aligns these six primary areas that you see on the screen. These six primary areas are aligned in order to provide that support to school divisions. These areas are grounded in science, in that science-based reading research, and those evidence-based literacy instructional practices. They work together to effectively support the intended outcomes of the Virginia Literacy Act. So we're gonna go through them uh, just briefly here. So the top for teacher preparation Educator preparation programs are tasked with producing teacher candidates who are knowledgeable about those evidence-based instructional practices and the science behind, and that science-based reading research behind those practices. School divisions then pick up the torch with professional development and continue to provide both new and veteran teachers with continued professional development that emphasizes the changes in practice and the, and the emphasis on systematic, explicit, and science-based reading instruction. An essential part of the Virginia Literacy Act is strengthening our family partnerships. The phrase, it takes a village, is even more evident now of, in the education of our children. The Virginia Literacy Act helps school divisions with providing more accessible data and at-home resources. And the emphasis is still on teachers educating children. However, you as your, as your child's first teacher are there and there are many opportunities for us to collaborate and support your students and your children's learning while in school and at home. Every school division is tasked under the Virginia Literacy Act to develop a division-wide literacy plan that outlines how they will address each of the requirements of the law. Williamsburg, James City County began working on our literacy plan well before the Virginia Literacy Act legislation, and we continue to strengthen it each year. This year, we added additional information about our new K-5 curriculum materials, Benchmark Advanced, as well as information about our professional learning that we have undergone with our WJCC educators. The literacy plan can be found in the language, English language arts section of our WJCC website. As you're probably aware, every school division in Virginia was re required to adopt a comprehensive core literacy curriculum from the VDOE's approved list. All of the approved curricula went through a rigorous review process, and in Williamsburg, James City County, we also completed our own selection process last January. This year, our educators are focused on learning how to fully utilize the enormous amount of resources that they are provided in our new Benchmark Advanced Curriculum materials. The last component of the Virginia Literacy Act is a new K-3 screening system that replaces the previous PALS assessment. This new screening system includes a whole new set of tasks, and we are deep into completing the assessments and learning how this new information about student learning can be used to inform our instruction. As you can see from these six facets of the Virginia Literacy Act, we have a lot of new this school year. Our goal as a division always remains on making the best decisions for our students and our educators, and we're working very hard to help our teachers and schools manage the enormous amount of change so that our students experience a seamless transition of instructional practices and day-to-day -day class.
classroom experience. Thank you, Robin, for that wonderful overview of all of the components of the legislation and how it is um, coming to life in our school division and school divisions across the Commonwealth. Um, but this evening, we really want to focus on you, our students, families, parents, and caregivers. Um, there's so much that happens every day in our schools to support every child to develop strong reading, writing, and communication skills. But as Robin said, we know that you are your children's most influential teacher. And so this evening, we want to share with you some resources about, that you can use at home to help your, to extend your children's learning at home. And um, through the questions, hopefully answer any questions that you may have about how they're learning at school. By working together in partnership and leveraging our resources and our community support, we can ensure that every one of our children receives an education that helps him or her realize their potential. So let's get started looking at some of our resources. What we want to share with you this evening is that there are um, numerous activities and strategies that you can use at home that you will find by using the link that is embedded in our division's website. So to find out more information about these activities, some of which we will highlight and many, many others. Um, you can start by going to the WJCC homepage. You choose academics in the ribbon at the top. And then you select English language arts from the drop down menu. And once you've selected that, you're going to scroll to the bottom right hand corner of that page. That's the page that we are looking at on the screen. And you can see that you can. Um, access the division literacy plan here on the right hand side of the screen, but you can also um, access the link to the resources we are going to focus on this evening. By clicking on that link, you will go to the resources for families page on the Virginia Literacy Partnerships website. Virginia Literacy Partnership is a department at the University of Virginia. Um, that is where the original PALS assessment that many of you may have heard of in the past um, was developed years ago. And um, the Virginia Literacy Partnership has been very active in revising that screening assessment to the current assessment we've all started using this year, VALS. Um, and they are also the VDOE or the Virginia Department of Education's partner in a lot of the professional development that our teachers are experiencing this year and other guidance that we will be using. So this is a website that we really encourage you to visit, not only for the resources, but it is just a wealth of information and tools for educators and families alike. So let's dive into a few of the activities and resources. So as parents and guardians, we want to recommend that you focus on activities in three particular areas. Um, and they are talking, reading, and writing. As you heard earlier in this presentation, word recognition and language comprehension are the foundations of skilled reading. And so by focusing on strategies and activities related to talking, reading, and writing, you can help your child build background knowledge and vocabulary, both of which are critical elements of language comprehension. Let's start with talking. Seems so easy. We do it a lot. But really the key is paying attention to the kind of talking that you are doing, the kind of talking that your child is doing so that that uh, communication, that oral language that is being developed, and we think about that often as our youngest children are developing those skills, but they really are critical even as our children age through elementary school. So talking with your child, um, not talking always to your child, but talking with your child so that you are really having the opportunity to have rich conversations to explore questions, topics of interest, and that you are, as you're talking with your child, you are actively encouraging your child to talk 
to you, to respond to you and to share their thoughts and to ask questions. Those of us who are a little older and our children have passed through school, um, we're very well uh, versed in how was your day? Good, not good, whatever the case may have been. What happened? Nothing. You know, the traditional one word, very closed response kind of conversation that can happen at the end of the day, because as Robin noted, they're tired. They've been working hard all day. But really thinking about, again, that quality of conversation you're having with your child so that you can have rich and open dis um, conversations, really focusing on more open-ended questions or prompts, such as, tell me what you did while you were at the park, as opposed to, who did you play with? One prompt really encourages your child to start to think about what they did and to tell you about that. And as you're listening, continuing to prompt them to tell you more, to give you deeper descriptions of what they did, what they experienced, as opposed to that, who did you play with? Which that's a great question, but it really invites a one, two, three word response. And so we really want to think about how we ask our children to engage in conversation with us. So we're getting that depth of, of thought and encouraging them at through our prompts to use rich vocabulary, to be descriptive and to use the language that we want them to carry into their reading and writing. Likewise, we often, as we talk to our children, we are giving them instructions. We are giving them prompts that they need in order to take care of self-care habits and other um, activities throughout the, the day at home. And so really prompting your child to, you know, listen carefully, to listen for all of the information that you're going to give them before they start to take action on it or to pay attention carefully. Um, watch me while I measure out this sugar very carefully before I put it in the mixing bowl. Or, hmm, let me think about this. Let's look at the butter. Is it creamed enough before I add the next set of ingredients? So again, just being very, very deliberate in how we talk with them and prompt them to pay attention to their surroundings. Um, and then finally, having those conversations both before, during, and after reading. Um, there's nothing more special than reading a wonderful story, a beloved story with your child, and just that opportunity to kind of quiet the day and settle in at the end of a long day. And having those great conversations with your child as you're reading that story or that informational text and peppering those wonderings throughout your reading, having that conversation. Um, I wonder if I noticed hmm, that reminded me of not to break up a story with, you know, long, long trips down memory lane, because that can happen as well. Um, but certainly, again, infusing and modeling that thought and conversation that should be paired when we're reading, um, because that's what we want our children to do as they as they read to comprehend and to understand as they get older, we want them to do that more independently so that they're really having the opportunity to process text. So. Robin, anything that you want to add to that? All right, but again, we can't um, underscore the importance of developing oral language skills. Um, again, we think about that as important for our youngest children, but it really is something that our children need to continue to develop as they progress through elementary school. All right. So the second part of this variable is reading. Um, you want to read to your child with enthusiasm and you want to read to them as often as possible. And that doesn't always have to be a story. It can be whatever piece of text is laying around. It can be the grocery list. Hmm, let's read through this grocery list again. Did we miss something? Um, so, you know, everyone has very busy lives and we're always trying to fit things in where they make the most sense for our children and for our day. 
So you may not, you may know in advance, you're not going to have a lot of time to read before your day comes to an end with your child. So looking for other opportunities to read, a recipe, uh, a quick article that you think would be of interest to them um, as you're getting ready for dinner. But reading and reading widely, um, so I'm gonna skip from the top to near the bottom, um, but reading widely is incredibly important. Our children, all of us, have favorite genres that we love to read. We um, have stories. Our children have stories that they love to read and reread. And that is very, very purposeful. And we don't want to discourage um, rereading those stories. We know how much they love them, um, no matter how tired we may become of them at times. Um, but we want you to also read widely. Um, poetry is very important. Poetry is very thought provoking, an excellent opportunity to get high quality reading in in a very short time. And often, uh, oftentimes provides a great opportunity to build in new vocabulary. Um, certainly fiction, informational text, articles, recipes, lists. Um, you received an email from a relative who lives, you know, far away, reading that, just whatever the reading is, um, so that your children see that reading comes in many, many different forms, and it impacts nearly every aspect of our life. Maybe it's filling out the check-in um, form before a doctor's appointment on your phone. There's reading everywhere, and so we want to involve our children with that where it is appropriate for their age and developmental level. So again, we're reinforcing the importance of reading in our lives. As you're reading with your children, you want to really notice new and interesting words. Um, it's amazing, absolutely amazing what little guys can learn to understand when we scaffold the vocabulary for them, when we help explain it with a quick explanation as we're reading. Uh, there were a few years that I, I stepped away from education while my little ones were very little and um, dove into some home daycare, which was wonderful. And in order to have an orderly lunchtime every day, I read aloud to them. As soon as the food hit the table, the books opened up. And it was just such a wonderful time. It gave for a quiet, calm meal, but it also gave them an opportunity to really hear um, great stories and for us to really learn new words. And it was just never ceased to amaze me how these little two and three-year-old brains could just um, seize on to words like agitated and, you know, really understand what, what that meant. Um, and that wasn't because I was demonstrating it. We were reading it in the book, Crick Wing. <laughs> um, but again, as you're reading, you want to discuss the story or the text and wonder and think aloud. Um, sometimes time is short and we just read from start to finish. But when time allows, really peppering in those questionings, those questions and those wonderings that, that you have um, as you're reading and, and asking, turning to your child, what do you think? What are you wondering about? Hmm, does, that reminds me of something. I wonder if it reminds you of the same thing. So asking those questions where you can. Um, modeling fluent reading is so incredibly important. And that's one of the most powerful reasons um, for our children to listen to others read aloud. And we say, you know, even our older children in elementary school, and I would even argue that our students in middle school benefit when they hear others read aloud, read fluently, and it helps them to understand um, not only what the story is about, but it helps them to understand um, how the story is written, how the mechanics are laid out with how the text is written. So that fluent reading is very, very important. And I thought that this graphic was a great way to show that there are different ways that you can read aloud with your child to model that fluent reading. You can certainly take turns. Um, and this can happen even with our youngest children. They know those stories they love. And you know that because when you're tired and you try to skip some lines, then they call you on it, right? So... <laughs> So taking turns, even if they aren't actually reading the print, they're still engaging with the story and they're using that story language and they're sounding like a reader. 
Um, then certainly you can read aloud together, which um, shared reading is something that our children are experiencing in their classrooms where the teacher is providing that strong first model of what it sounds like when we read with fluency. And then you can certainly um, take turns. So you might read something and then have your child reread it. Um, and you can do this with short passages. Even if your child is enjoying a chapter book and you're reading it together, um, you can still join in that kind of fluent reading where maybe they have some several lines in a particular scene in the story that are very exciting that they love and you read it and then they can reread it. So there are lots of ways to engage your children with fluent reading. One thing um, that is bound to happen when your child is reading aloud to you, if you have the opportunity to, to listen to them read or, or have them read to you, is they're going to stumble over, over some words. They're going to come to words that they don't know. And my favorite go-to strategy as a mom, I have a kindergartner and a third grader, and it works for both. It works for all levels, is to take whatever word they're struggling with, take it back to the sound level. So let's say, for example, my kindergartner, we were actually just reading last night and she had brought a book home from the library about horses. And she's not at the point now where she's really able to decode that word horse off of the page. And so when she came to the word horse, even though there was a picture of a horse, I wanted to keep her looking at the print and using that sound and letter correspondence that we talked about earlier in the presentation. And so I, I focused her on the word and said, these sounds are, or, and I gave her the sounds and then she has been working and even at the kindergarten level, they're blending sounds together. So she's able to blend those sounds and then produce the word. So for our littlest uh, readers, uh, that's a really good strategy is to just take the sounds of the word and give them the sounds and they can blend them together. For our older readers, they're going to stumble on words that have multiple syllables or some content words, photosynthesis or something from a science or a social studies text. And so in those cases, when it's a much longer and much more complicated word, instead of breaking it down into each individual sound, I usually with my son, what I'll do, and, and this is a favorite strategy, I break it down to the syllable level. So I might break it up and say the first part of this word is photo, and the next part of the word is synthesis. Or if it's a little bit easier of a word, then um, then I might break it down into um, in, into just the syllables. So this says constitution, constitution. Um, and so that's just a really simple strategy. Whenever your child comes to a word that they stumble on, just pull out those sounds. Uh, that's that's a really good go to. Absolutely, and again. You want, um, when we talk about productive struggle, and so, you know, just like Robin said, knowing what your, you know what your child can do, and so knowing how to scaffold, how to give them the, the building blocks without giving them the answer, so that if it's appropriate, you're giving them the building blocks so that they can, they can blend those sounds together to make that word. Um, but we want to um, encourage them and build up their confidence and certainly build up their intrinsic motivation by reading things that they're interested in. And again, just that quality time around having those conversations. And finally, as we've just talked about, not only modeling fluent reading, but you're reading aloud to your child, but with your child. So, you know, again, some nights, there's only a few minutes before it really needs to be bedtime. And so it's got to be a quick read. And other days and evenings, there's there's time for more conversation and, and time with the story. All right. So we've talked about talking, reading, 
let's talk for a minute about writing. Writing can be a little trickier, quite honestly, um, because just like your child may experience coming across a word they don't know when they're reading, we want them to um, want to use such rich vocabulary when they're writing and expressing their thoughts and what they know that it's not unusual for young children to want to use words that they shouldn't know how to spell yet. Um, and so thinking about all the ways we can engage them with writers to build that motivation and love of communicating and expressing themselves through writing without necessarily getting bogged down in some of the challenging aspects of it, such as spelling vocabulary that they don't, they don't have it mastered yet. So let's go through some ideas and then we'll talk about how to tackle what to do when your child wants to use a word they don't know how to spell. Um, first of all, allow your child to see you writing. We use writing, again, just like reading. Writing is very important across our lives, whether that's actually physically pen and paper writing or whether it's making those lists or setting those reminders for ourselves and our phone. We use writing all the time. And so the more our children, the more we um, explicitly call out to them how we are being writers, the more they can see how writing has a purpose in their lives beyond the writing that they're doing in school um, as part of their assignment. So notes, lists, journaling, and involving them to get to participate as a writer. You know, they probably are motivated that you have something they want on that grocery list so that you don't forget it when you go to the store on over the weekend. So encouraging them to add it to the list. Um, sending someone a note um, to remind them of something. Um, in any way that you can encourage them to share their thoughts, to have them see that writing is really about communicating what we know, what we need, um, communicating with others. So in encouraging your child to write, even as a young child, when writing at that stage is very appropriate to be scribbling um, or for them to be more oriented towards drawing pictures. That's okay. Those are the early stages of writing with our preschoolers. And as our children are coming into kindergarten, learning that all of those letters that they are learning in school have associated sounds that then they start to put that code together and put it on paper. Um, but encouraging them to write, even if it's scribbles or they need to, the, your youngest children need to draw pictures. That's all, again, it's about communicating their thoughts on paper. Um, writing, again, together with your child, sitting down together and creating that list. Um, you know, oh, you want um, snacks? Okay, well, we're going to put snacks on the list. Hmm, Snacks. When I say that, what sound do I hear first? Oh, I hear, s what letter do I need to put? Why don't you put the S on the paper? Maybe they don't know how to spell the rest of it, and that's fine. But again, they're participating. Um, sending emails and using other forms of communication so that they are involved in the process. That's really, really important. And sharing that writing. So that there's that balance and that's different for every child as they progress along the stages of becoming proficient writers. But uh, avoiding writing for your child all the time, finding those ways again. If you know they know the letter S and they want the word snacks on the list, then letting them put that S to get the word snacks or on the, on the list, but not always writing for them because that helps to build their confidence, their pride, and their ownership for what they can do. Um, I thought this next idea was particularly um, useful and wondering where it was 20 years ago when my children were little, um, but using a family message board to encourage writing. Something, you know, don't forget baseball practice, or again, you know, don't forget to put snacks on the list, things like that. But again, showing that writing has a purpose, that it's communicating what we need, it's communicating our thoughts. So I think that's very purposeful. Um, showing interest in your child's writing is very important. Um, and knowing when to ignore the minor errors that may be there 
And again, that's a very fine line that um, as parents, we wrestle with it. As teachers, we wrestle with it. You know, not having to overcorrect everything. Um, where are the where are the areas or the opportunities for us to bring their knowledge in, asking them what they think they may want support with or help with is often empowering as well. I wanted to use the word dragon, but I don't know how to spell dragon. Okay, let's break it up. Let's think about what sounds you do hear because you know a lot of those sounds. So again, showing interest without overcorrecting um, and without um, it, it reinforcing for them that everything has to be perfect. Um, keeping writing tools handy, chalk, crowns, markers, pencils, an alphabet chart, um, a list of high frequency words so that again, we want to enable our children to be as independent as is reasonably possible. So if there is a list of words um, maybe you have a, a list of the foods that they like to have on the grocery list most often, and you have that handy. So it's like a word bank. So they can find it and they can put it on the list themselves. So scaffolding it with appropriate tools and then um, encouraging your children to write to label their environment, especially for our young children. That is very, very powerful. Um, and they, they're very proud to see things in their environment that they have identified as important to them that they want to, want to label. So Robin, I'm sure you have some ideas about how to um, handle when yeah. they ask, how do you spell this? <laughs> That's yeah. one of the most frequently asked questions probably in school. The most frequently asked question. And if you have a young writer who's working with pretty simple words, you know, three letter words with a short vowel like cat or mop. Um, the practice that's really easy to replicate at home is to have the student say the word. So if the word is mop, you as a parent or family member would say the word and have have your child repeat it to you so you so that they're actually saying the whole word together. And then you're going to have them say each sound individually. So if the word is mop, we would say, oh, the word you're trying to write is mop. Let's say those sounds. And I use my fingers to tap, or you might you know, tap on a, on a table or, or um, point. You could even use something that you have lying around the house, um, you know, pennies or something, just something to represent each of the sounds. And so if the word was mop, we'd say mop, and then we would say each sound. Mm, uh, what sound did we hear first? That first sound was mm. What letter makes the sound? Just as Robin said, and then we that letter is M. And at any point throughout this uh, interaction, your child is, is confused or doesn't seem to know then there is no harm whatsoever in telling them what it what it is. So if your your little one, we said the first sound was mm, what letter makes that sound and they don't know, then it's perfectly fine to say, oh, an M makes that sound mm. Here's what it looks like. And then maybe draw that for them. Um, so for our, our youngest writers, uh, we say the word, we say the sounds, and then we say the letter and write the letter for each of those sounds. For our older students and, and, and as students, um, as they, they reach into more complicated words, uh, we have a lot of factors that play into it that not every sound that they hear is represented by the same letter or the same sets of letters. And so in, for us as adults, um, we can learn where the, the origins of the words come from. And many of our older students are learning about the origins of the words. Are the roots of the word from, the, uh, from Latin? Or is, do, do they have Greek origins? Um, where do the words come from? Because a lot of times that has an influence on how the word is spelled. And so what we wanna make sure that we are not doing is telling our, our children, oh, 
the English language is just silly and there's no, there's really no reason. I, I don't really know why the word is spelled that way. It's just, it's just silly. And because what that does is it, it, when we say that there's really no rhyme or reason, then we're taking away that, that desire to learn or that, that, um, that intrigue that there really is a reason why each and every one of our English words are spelled in a certain way. And it has to do with the original language um, that that it came from and that we're borrowing um, or that we've taken and uh, our English pronunciation has um, has overcome, but we've ret retained that original spelling. So with our older students, um, and and with my third grader all of the time he'll ask to spell a word and and maybe the word is dragon and so that that last sound in dragon when we say it we say dragon but we know that it's spelled o n at the end and so i'll just tell him and i'll say you know i wonder where that word comes from i know that that word is that last part it sounds like in but in this particular word, it's spelled O-N. Or, um, and so you can do that with any word. Um, if the sound and the spelling doesn't quite match up, then we can, um, we can reference, well, that word must come from a different language. Uh, and so in that word, that particular sound is spelled this way. And then in our, uh, classrooms, we call those heart words. And so those are parts of the word that we want to know by heart. Um, or they might just be parts of the words that we haven't learned the reason we, you know, our younger kids haven't learned the, the, uh, the Latin or the Greek or the Anglo Saxon origins of the words quite yet. All right. So. Um, though most of the ideas that you are going to find as you explore the family resources um, site on the VLP webpage um, are easy to implement in almost any context, and most of them require very few materials, they all lead back to that really important opportunity to build background knowledge and vocabulary for our students um, that will in turn really support them to read and to write so that they can both gain and communicate new knowledge. So we really can't underscore the importance of those three kinds of activities. And we encourage you to visit um, the VLP website, the family resources um, page there and explore. I um, have spent quite a bit of time there myself and know that it's really like going down a rabbit hole. Like one link leads to another link, leads to another link. And they're really very high quality activities and ideas there. But there are also a number of articles through most of the links that if you want to um, learn more, dig into different aspects of literacy instruction and um, how you can help your child at home, there are lots of articles and video links that you can access as well. So a very high quality resource that again is designed by VLP in alignment with the legislation and our desire to have stronger partnerships with our families by providing um, high quality resources. Thank you, Robin and Robin. That was awesome. And I, I actually took some takeaways as well for my four-year-old at home. So I'll be, I'll be using that. While we're going through and while everyone is putting in some questions, I know that we have a couple that are queued up. We're going to give um, our presenters just a couple minutes just to kind of go through those and, and formulate the answers. Um, in the meantime, if you could scan the QR code and provide us some feedback, I've also dropped a link in the chat if you are on your phone already and you just want to click it to take the quick survey, that would be helpful. We take this feedback and we we apply it to future family academies that we work on um, to, to really meet the needs of our families. Um, so go ahead and uh, give you a couple minutes for that. Ronnie, let us know when we're ready to answer some of the questions in the in the Q and A. 
Um, I think you could probably, I mean, the 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 feedback is uh, only a couple of questions. So um, I think we can go ahead and kind of get that started as well. Okay, so I'm going to throw the first question to you. <laughs> it, um, it was a question about will the PowerPoint be shared after the presentation? Yeah, so what we'll do is we've recorded this presentation. So what we can, we will post it online. Um, we can absolutely share the the presentation itself as well as a PDF. Um, and if you're subscribed to the Family Academy newsletter, you'll get a you'll get an email as well next month if you by chance forget all about it by by the time that comes out. All right. The next question is asking um, us to share a little bit about the VALS assessment and how it's different from PALS. Uh, so the the PALS assessment is actually it it was actually about 20 years old and had not gone through a redesign or um, or well a redesign for for over 20 years. And so the tasks and the way that it was set up and scored really weren't aligned to uh, the science based reading research and the evidence based literacy instruction uh, that that follows from like the simple view of reading or uh, the elements of the Virginia Literacy Act. And so with the new VALS assessment, we see uh, more tasks. Uh, it is a longer assessment, um, but it is serving the same purpose. So if we were to look at similarities between the two, if I were to draw a Venn diagram, similarities in the middle between the two assessments would be they both serve as a screener. So they're screening our students in grades kindergarten through third grade um, for who's at risk for reading difficulty. The differences between the assessments would be in the tasks that they're using and the emphasis that is being placed on uh, the different tasks as far as how they how those tasks relate to a student's risk for reading difficulty. So the new VALS assessment is looking at both tasks in the code, they call it the code based, which aligns with that word recognition or that blue box of that simple view of reading. So all of the, the skills that are required for students to be able to read the print on the page, there are tasks on the VAL screener that give teachers information about how well the student is developing with those skills. And so those tasks are phonemic awareness tasks like hearing words and being able to segment them into the sounds. The word is cat and at are the sounds or blending the sounds together. Um, there's decoding. So they're presented with a list of words and then um, can, they, can they read that list of words? And they're not sight words are words that are high frequency words that on the, the previous PALS assessment, it was a list of high frequency words. But now with the VALS assessment, they're actually words that should be decodable for each of the particular grade levels. So that's a change and a difference between the two tests that they're looking more at the skill of being able to match those sounds and the letters together and blend it all together to read the words. So VALS has the code based or that word recognition um, elements, but then they also have a whole new battery of language comprehension tasks. And so these are tasks that we did not see on the previous PALS assessment. So these language comprehension tasks are going to be um, a more in-depth retelling. So listening to a story and then being able to retell back the key pieces of it. Um, also, uh, there is a vocabulary um, a task, so students are presented with pictures of, of fairly common and age level appropriate um, pictures and asked to, um, to, to say the word. Um, and then also there is a, um, a processing uh, task where the students are asked to repeat a series of letters um, in quick succession. And so that has been scientifically used in, um, in determining uh, risk for reading. Uh, the 
another part of that question was, is there a way for parents to view the assessment? And so viewing the actual assessment, obviously we have um, putting out the assessment um, for public uses is not um, it's not something that the Virginia Literacy Partnerships is, is doing. However, they do have a lot of information about the tasks and a lot of descriptions about them. Um, and that is going to be found at that literacy.virginia.edu website. So there's a, a section for families, but then there's also a section that just describes the screener and the tasks and um, and how it relates to that science-based reading research. Another great place to get information about the VALS assessment will be in the upcoming parent um, and family conference time with your child's teacher. Um, so your child's teacher will be able to share um, uh, information about the assessment as well. Our next question um, is about writing instruction and what it looks like at the upper elementary level specifically. So in all of our grade levels, um, including our upper elementary levels with the benchmark curriculum, writing plays a, a much more prominent role in the curriculum materials and the instructional practices. And so there's actually two opportunities uh, every day that students are writing. One is during an actual writing block where they are going through the process of writing. So where they're brainstorming and then they are um, planning their writing and then drafting, editing, and then publishing. And that takes place over the course of a three week unit. And so the first week is heavy on the teacher modeling the elements of those, um, of those instructional practices. And then the second week is where the students and the teacher are crafting uh, the text together. And then the third week is when the students uh, actually get to craft the text uh, more independently on their own. And that three week cycle repeats with each of the units in the benchmark curriculum. The, um, each of the units has a specific genre of writing. So it might be writing an informational text or an opinion piece um, or a narrative piece. And so those also cycle through the units. So grade four specifically, but it's, it's actually all of our K-5 grade levels. Um, they follow the same, the same writing um, process, writing um, procedure. The second area that writing happens every day in the classrooms is writing to respond to our reading. So this is not crafting a writing piece um, and going through the writing process, but it's using writing to respond to reading, whether it's annotating in the student booklet uh, and picking out the key ideas from the reading that the students are doing, or it may be writing to answer a question and to articulate their thoughts. And so students are doing a lot of learning about how to organize their ideas into a thoughtful response. Um, so that they can they can write in response to the text that they're reading. Did I leave anything right. up, Kevin? <laughs> no, that was an excellent um, description of how writing instruction is changing and, as you said, taking a much more prominent role in our daily literacy block mm -hmm. um, each day in every grade level. Um, I was at a school today and saw just phenomenal third grade writing um, that's happened here in the first seven weeks of school. It just, I was so incredibly impressed with the quality of, of the writing. And I think it's coming from that very explicit, continuous instruction over the course of a three-week unit. Um, Robin, uh, there, there's another question about just really how has literacy instruction changed in WJCC? So since you just talked about the writing block, um, I thought maybe you might wanna talk about um, the language comprehension and the word recognition block so that um, our participants have kind of a better overview of what that literacy instruction looks like every day. And then we'll pause to ask Ronnie where we are because I know we're, we're past our time. Absolutely. So um, literacy instruction in WJCC historically has, uh, if I were to describe how it was organized, it would be a description of organization around whole group, 
student experiences and small group student experiences. So the literacy block um, within uh, our classrooms historically uh, would have been divided into here's some of our whole group time and here's some of our small group time. And um, the small group kind of reading rotations was a prominent time in our daily uh, literacy block. Uh, with the advent of the Virginia Literacy Act and our new benchmark advanced curriculum and reimagining how literacy instruction works in our school system, um, our, our literacy blocks, while the time of the literacy block hasn't changed, we've, we have redesigned how we're using that time and how we are dedicating time to those components of the simple view of reading and that reading um, science based reading research. So every classroom has four dedicated blocks of time within their literacy block that are aligned to those elements of um, the simple view of reading. So each classroom has their um, words. We, it, you'll, you may hear it called word study or phonics time or word recognition time. And so that's the time where students in all grade levels appropriate to their level are learning about how to, um, how to read the words on the page. And so in our kindergarten and our first grade, it's going to be a lot of matching those sounds to the letters and blending them together and reading some simpler words. But all the way up into fifth grade, that's when we're going to be learning about those word origins and um, breaking apart those more complicated multisyllabic words and those different um, spelling patterns in the words that help us to both read and write uh, those words. So every classroom has a, a word recognition block. Every classroom also has a language comprehension block. And so that's aligned with the meaning making. And that's where we're reading a lot of the texts and annotating and discussing our ideas. So the talking and the reading and the writing, it's all coming together in our classrooms as well. Um, and so, so during that language comprehension time, that's when, um, when the students are really learning those skills, building that vocabulary uh, to, to be able to build up those muscles, those brain muscles. Um, for language comprehension. Um, then there's also the writing block. Uh, and then we also have what we call our differentiated instruction block. And so that is in addition to time during the other blocks where teachers are able to work with small groups of students, we have a differentiated instruction block where uh, it's another time for teachers to be able to work with small groups of students um, and students to work in the All right, uh, I think we have time for um, one more. And let's look through and we can, um, or we have a note that we can maybe email some of the folks that have um, posed questions um, with their names. Yes, um, well, I thought that that's a great idea. So we, we can get back to everybody to make sure everyone gets a response to their question because we really appreciate your questions. But something that might be of interest to a number of our participants is what is our response um, if through this screener, we know that a student is having difficulty. So maybe we can um, share with our families, like what's the next step? We've screened our children. We understand um, what skill areas may be the next opportunity for them if they're not where we want them to be right now um, for their grade level. What, how will families know about that? Robin, you mentioned that at parent-teacher conferences, which will be coming up just in a couple of weeks, um, classroom teachers will share results of the screener with, with all parents. Mm -hmm. um, but what else is going to happen? How else can families get involved? So um, we, as you said, Robin, we are screening students and um, we'll be able to share that at, at conferences. Um, we're also progress monitoring and um, throughout the school year. So that's another opportunity for teachers to check in and for um, teachers and families to, um, to, to build that connection 
um, and check in on how how their student is doing. I saw a question here about assessing students in grades four and five. Um, so this year we do not have the VAL assessment for students in grades four and five. And so we are replicating some of the, the key assessments. So we're using the state provided assessments um, as our screeners. So there's a Virginia growth a literacy assessment that we can use as a, as a screener. And then if students struggle with that or um, with, uh, with the previous SOL test, the standards of learning test in a previous school year, then we have, um, we have additional assessments that mirror the, the assessments that we're using in the lower grades. So if a student, if an older student is struggling with um, an, a reading comprehension test, then we wanna dig in and see, is it because the word recognition part is more challenging? And so then um, we're gonna give them an assessment that's going to uh, tell us whether they're able to decode the words on the page. Um, or maybe it might be a fluency um, assessment. So we'll use some of those more, those assessments there. Did I answer the question, Robin? I, I think you did. You um, So we have lots of ways that we really closely um, observe our students as readers and writers to try to understand what their needs are. And then um, if, if your child um, on the screener is identified as being at um, high risk of potentially developing a reading difficulty, um, then you will work, you'll have the opportunity to work with your child's teacher and school to develop a, a student specific reading plan for your child to make sure that everyone is very aware of what are their priority opportunities for additional instruction beyond the instruction that Robin described is happening in every classroom for all of our children. And then how you can be a part of that process and be aware, as Robin said, um, we are very committed to progress monitoring. So not only those large assessment opportunities that are sprinkled throughout the year, but we are looking at how we can monitor what students are doing on a frequent weekly, bi-weekly basis to know, are they responding to the instruction? Um, and if not, then how can we make instructional changes so that they continue to grow and um, along that continuum of skills? Um, so Ronnie, what would be the best way for us to support our participants whose questions didn't get answered tonight, but we wanna make sure that they do get a response? So what we'll do is after this uh, Zoom webinar, I'll be able to pull the Q&As and we'll email them directly um, okay. with the responses based on their questions. Wonderful. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I love that there were so many questions um, <clears throat> and uh, be on the lookout for the recording. It'll be on the Family Academy website. Um, and once again, if you have any questions that pop up after this, feel free to email uh, engage at wjccschools.org and we'll get those uh, questions over to our presenters. Thank you guys. Have a good evening. Thank you.